Hello, listeners. Thank you for joining us at Autism Spectrum Resources for Marriage and Family. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie Holmes. If you've been following the show, you or if you're new, um, I am a former counselor, now certified autism specialist and coach for neurodiverse couples. But I feel my real credentials come from being the mom of two pretty awesome neurodivergent adult kids, one with ADHD, one who is on the spectrum, and married to someone on the spectrum with a little bit of ADD flavoring on top. Uh, So this means I'm the neurotypical of my family system and pretty much the prefrontal lobe and executive function in my neurodiverse family system. (laughs) You can follow our story in our new book written by the four of us, Embracing the Autism Spectrum, Finding Hope and Joy, Navigating the Neurodiverse Family Journey. I'm so excited to have as our guest, um, a previous guest, if you remember our discussion on predictive coding error um, and the autistic brain, and there's a book by the similar name, our guest, Dr. Peter Vermulen. Welcome back and thank you for being here. It's another pleasure being here, Stephanie. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Now, the full, there's so much in his bio. I couldn't even begin (laughs) to read all of it. So I've got a shortened bio for you, but look in the show notes and you can find all of the awesome things that Dr. Peter is doing. So he has his bachelor's in family science um, from Brussels back in 1985. In the same year, a master's in psychology and clinical educationalist at the oldest university of Belgium, the University of Leuven. Uh, because he got the taste of studying at the oldest universities, Peter started the study at the oldest university in the, ne- in the of the Netherlands, Leiden, um, which already working in the field of autism. He obtained his PhD in 2002 with his research on late diagnosis in people on the autism spectrum with above average IQs, which is great. That totally fits some of the things that um, I am interested in and you've heard on the show before. So officially, it's Dr. Peter Vermulen, MSc, PhD. But today, he's just going to be Dr. Peter. (laughs) So thank you for that. Um, I so enjoyed our discussion on predictive error coding. I got your book, and I just have to tell you, I have to read it like four to five pages at a time, stop and take a break, let my brain process and digest. And I've really been diving into it um, because of a book that I'm writing as well, and your work on the predictive air coding vein is, is part of what I'm writing about. So i um, so happy about that. But today I wanted to talk about um, happiness and well-being and stress, because sometimes stress being the opposite um, um, in the autism community, not just in children, but since you also work with adults um, with a later diagnosis um, who have average to probably above average IQs, would love to have that conversation with you. So I'm going to kind of kick it off for you to start that. I'm going to pull up your article so I can also follow along to ask questions, but um, kind of kick us off on happiness and stress and what got you into the study that you did that you shared with me. Yeah, that, um, you know, I've always been interested in how an autistic brain works, and that was uh, one of my special interests. Some people say I, it's more like a preoccupation, but okay. Um, but at a given moment, I thought, okay, I, I think I know quite well how an autistic brain works, but I've never done anything with the consequences of it. I've always uh, expressed in my books, this leads to a lot of uncertainty, this leads to a lot of uh, feelings of unpredictability, that leads to anxiety. And then I think, come on, Peter, you describe what the consequences are, but now it's time to do something about the consequences. And that's when I changed my focus uh, from only describing the difficulties to, come on, Peter, help them with those things that are difficult. And, and then I got into well-being. Because you can still focus on stress, which I always have done, but you know, too often I think we only uh, put uh, the, the the light spots on well-being when there is a lack of well-being, and I think we should have a more positive focus. For instance, when do you, as a parent of an autistic child, when do you get a phone call from school? Probably when something went not very well. Um, I have two kids and one of them is neurodivergent as well. It, when they called me, it was always because he had done something again <laughs> or something went wrong. I think, why don't we change the focus into, hey, Peter, could you come over to school? Why? Well, your son had a, uh, had such a wonderful day. We want to find out why and how. And I think that's changed my mind uh, from a focus, from a lack of well-being and stress, which, which we should not ignore to foc- a positive focus on well-being. I would have dropped dead if I would have ever gotten a call that said, your daughter's doing so amazing. We want to share this joy with you. <laughs> it was always like I had like PTSD for my phone for many years <laughs> later, like, oh no, why is the school 
like calling me. Oh yeah, you train schools now. It might. It's not about your daughter. <laughs> so what a what a concept. Can we kind of lay the um, foundation with just emotions in general, just kind of how emotions work and how there's that difference in processing in the neurodivergent brain versus the neurotypical brain as we kind of start this conversation on happiness and well being. Well, to start with, I don't think that uh, autistic people have different emotions. I think they have the same emotions as everyone. I think there's only human emotions. I'm going to I'm gonna challenge you, Stephanie. Name me one emotion that only autistic people have. Oh, no, I meant like they express differently. Feeling and they expressing. Express differently. Same, the uh, same what, feelings, yes. but being expressed, felt, different levels. Because usually there's a shorter affect or shorter range sometimes of those emotions and being able to split, display those emotions. So I apologize. Yes. No, 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 no. I understand. <laughs> but I, I'm saying this also because this is one of the many misunderstandings that we think that because the autistic brain works differently, and it does, that we're talking about a different species. No, there are human beings with the same emotions, but it is true that um, happiness becomes more a challenge when you have difficulties, for instance, reading your own bodily signals and finding out whether you are doing good or not, whether you are happy or not. And the different expression is often the consequence of an autistic child not even knowing what's going on inside his body. And and well-being, uh, happiness, is basically feeling good about yourself and feeling good about the world and feeling good are bodily signals. For instance, I see a lot of work on emotion regulation in autistic children because many of them indeed often don't feel very well and then they get overwhelmed by all these emotions. Uh, that they can't handle. I think well-being, part of it is emotion regulation, but it means basically that you start to learn what happiness is. And what I found out is we teach autistic children a lot of concepts, and we do something that is known as psychoeducation, which means we explain the diagnosis to them so they learn about themselves. But what I still lack is what do we do to teach autistic children about happiness? How can they learn what happiness is and how they can find out what makes them happy? Because what makes an autistic child happy is not necessarily what makes you and me happy. Or what makes me happy is not necessarily what makes you happy. And what we what we see is that autistic children sometimes, um, they, they have certain needs that is that are linked to their well-being that other people would never think of as part of happiness. To name just one thing, predictability. Um, and you know, that's, that's my work right now, trying to, to explain to people that, um, we need to make everything autism friendly, whatever we do in terms of working on well-being in autistic children, we also need to make it autism friendly. And many people don't think about predictability as a source of well-being. Absolutely. And one thing I was reading, um, <laughs> even how some of the assessments or, um, self-report inventories um, can be, even those that are meant for like the, the um, autism quiz or Aspie quiz, some of the ones out there, the language, like I was kind of chuckling a little bit because it's like, you feel this often or very frequently. Well, some of my people would say, well, define often. How often is often and how is that different than frequently and how is infrequently? And then it says always or never, and they're they're never going to pick always or never because that's too uh, black and white. And so they tend to pick toward the middle. And then we start like going back and forth and frequently often. And it's like, okay, this was not meant really for an no. individual to take. <laughs> now, I have the same experience. You know, um, there's there's many good researchers on well-being. And there are, there are no many tools and questionnaires around well-being. One of them is um, developed by one of the main researchers in the field uh, at Diener. He has done wonderful research, but his questionnaire is not autism friendly. One of the questions is, in most ways, my life is close to my ideal. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What ideal are we talking about here? And in most ways, is that two ways or is that 15 ways? <laughs> just more and than that one? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And then I, I remember that one of the questions was also, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. Now, besides the thing that almost nothing is already vague, uh, one of the autistic adults I work with said, this guy who developed this questionnaire, does he believe in reincarnation or what? You can't live your life over. So what a stupid question this is. You only live once. <laughs> 
Uh, so I think um, when we work on well-being, uh, which we should, because there is an increased risk if uh, if we look at the autistic population, um, lifelong prevalence of things like anxiety disorder and depression are are much higher than in the neurotypical population. So there is an increased risk for a lack of well-being. And that makes well-being more a priority, in, uh, I think, in, in the field. Um, while most people think that independence is a priority, working on functional skills, teach those kids social skills, teach them communication skills. And, and that's important. I don't doubt the importance of that. But I think, where is well-being? Because what we often see is that when you don't feel good, you're not open for many new things. You're not open for learning, and that's not even autistic. That's human. When I'm stressed, my wife doesn't have to improvise a lot and come up with new thrilling ideas. I, I say, come on, <laughs> I'm, I'm already stressed enough. Let's keep it to the old routines here. Um, so I think working on well-being should be done before we work on the functional skills, because then children will make more progress in the programs we set up to teach them those functional skills. Because happy, happy learners are more performing. Right. And I think that's the same with the adult population when I'm working with marriage is um, when there's stress and there's the negative cycle and a couple's been caught in a really negative cycle for a long time. You know, when there's stress, there's no new learning. I mean, sometimes it's difficult taking it out of this context and putting in this context anyway, but new learning when any person is under stress or overwhelmed is not going to happen for any brain because you're just trying to get through it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Nobody so what- learns under stress. So. Yeah. One of my clients came up with this, and I hope this uh, translates. We have water parks, um, a lot of water parks where I live in the Southeast. And there's these things, I hate them, but there's these like cones that are kind of like dangling and the water fills in with them. And then like one more drop, they go like whoosh. And then like, if you're going underneath that, you get like the whole water on your head. And what the um, autistic client was telling me as an adult, he's like, I don't know when my cone is a quarter full, half full or three fourths full. But I know that by the time I get home, if my wife said, like, did you forget the milk at the grocery store? That last drop, she gets the whole whoosh of the whole day or week that I didn't even know was there. And then for her, it's this reaction like, why am I getting such a un, a, such a big reaction to a little question that it's really a stored up thing from a day or a week? Can you kind of speak to that? Like what's happening in that? Yes, kind of yes. Body? Yeah. This is something I hear a lot, not only uh, about adults, but also from children. I know many, many uh, of your listeners, uh, many of the listeners here, they they know about the incredible five-point scale, and they know about the importance of visualizing. And what I often see in classrooms is, you know, those color schemes with green to yellow to orange to red. But what I often hear from parents, from teachers, but also from partners of autistic people is, wow, we always go straight from green to red. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, the cone that suddenly goes down and, and everything comes out. Now, why? where does it come from? It comes again from the fact that um, I think everybody goes from green to yellow to orange to red. But if you have difficulties monitoring your arousal, uh, the, the status of your well-being, then suddenly your behavior shows that you're in the red zone. While before, there's no typical behavior for being in the yellow. Well, there's maybe minor behaviors, but it's difficult to notice it yourself. But the main thing is um, that um, what we discovered is that autistic people have difficulties reading their own bodies. For instance, there's research uh, where they ask autistic and non-autistic children to, um, to guess what their heart rate was. Um, that's called cardiac awareness. Now, uh, monitoring your your heart rate is very important for your well being, because if your heart rate goes up, then you need to first of all you need to pick the signal up. The second thing you need to put it into context. And here I refer to my work on the prediction error and the context thing again. Uh, but if you just run up the stairs, then you should not think, "Oh Jesus, I think I'm very anxious here." or stress. No, you ran up the stairs. And that's the difficult part. Autistic people get all these bodily signals, their body reacts, they produce the same adrenaline when they get angry and so on. The only problem is their brain has difficulties processing all that information. And, And that could lead indeed to not noticing that the cone is almost full. You know, even 
they 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 are very unpredictable in those water parks i know but most people can make a smart guess okay i've been a while under this cone i think it will not take very long anymore before it's going to turn over and the same is with your bodily states we're not all perfect in reading our bodily signals but we know okay if i don't take a moment off here i'm gonna be my cone is gonna turn over now what the one of the recommendations that I do in practice, because then people ask me, what can we do about it? Then I say, okay, my golden rule for well-being and happiness, insert well-being activities throughout the day and don't wait until the cone is full. Because what I often see, for instance, with relaxation breaths or with relaxation exercises or a little bit of yoga and so on, all those things work can work with autistic people as well, but that people only put it on the program when the child is too stressed, too anxious, when there is, uh, when there was a meltdown, when, when the cone turned over and then people say, do your breathing uh, exercise. And that's too late. I think we should. Um, and that's one of the things I always say around happiness and well-being. do it throughout the day. And sometimes people say, but he's calm now. Why should he do his relaxation breath? Precisely because maybe he is already in the orange zone and you don't notice it but he does know it himself as well. So if you now put in some relaxation, he will go back to yellow or hopefully even to green. And then he will not explode in an hour. Yeah, I, I try to get my adults to understand this too, because many of my adults are in some kind of computer field or they're doing something, they're sitting in front of a computer. And so you're kind of in it and you're doing your work and you're not really getting up. And I'm like, how many times did you get up in the day? Um, how many times did you even just take some stairs or get out of that scene to go outside? You can take your breaks and just walk outside in nature or even sit in your car and, and listen to your favorite song. And it's like, why would I do that? I'm not stressed. And it's kind of the same thing. I call it either a sensory diet or pre-regulating. Um, you're preparing to go home. You've got so many spoons and you've got so much that, you know, you can control, but like you go into that zone, right? You, you're managing stress and working in emails and calls all day. And you're kind of in that focus and that flow, but not really paying attention sometimes to hunger, needing yeah, to go exactly. to the restroom, yeah. needing to drink water. And then, so you've got all this other biological stuff on top of, and it's like, if you would just take some five minute breaks throughout your work day, you would be amazed at how different that would be. And that's a hard sell, Dr. It, I know, I know. And it's not just, um, you know, if they don't want to take a break, what I then say is uh, at least when you make transitions, you make sure that there's a kind of climatization phase, which means, for instance, a husband coming home, that's, that's a tip that I would give to the partner. Okay, your question about the milk, okay, but maybe give him 10 minutes first so he can kind of you know, get into, I'm home now, and then ask him about the milk, because probably his, his cone is still full when he arrives home. And if he can empty it a little bit by doing something that relaxing, by, by drinking a cup of tea or whatever, taking a small walk or whatever. Um, but I also tell it to autistic children and, and parents, you know, when you come home, don't start doing your household chores or your homework immediately. Give yourself some relaxing time so you can make the transition. I want to share this text. My husband said that I could share it because um, I, I was like, this totally goes with what we're talking about today, babe. So uh, my husband, has uh, he has to travel a lot for work and he doesn't specifically like there's a city, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and it's full of shows and the most non-autistic friendly city in the world, I think. But um, so he had to go for work and he was going to be there over a weekend. I was like, babe, you should really do something fun. You know, he's a musician. He loves um, guitar music. And there was going to be like this, um, his three, three of his favorite guitarists were going to be there. I was like, you should, you should do that. And it was a hard sell because he's frugal and doesn't like to spend money on himself. But I got this text and it made me smile because I knew that this um, conversation was coming up. He said, um, I want to tell you, I am noticing I'm in an elevated state. I think this might be excitement. I'm not sure, at least for me. <laughs> and I wrote back, I'm so excited you're in an elevated state. <laughs> Enjoy your show. <laughs> But getting a blip on his radar sometimes of something that's happy or excitement is pretty huge. So that was a big day to have an elevated state um, because like even um, processing special events and holidays, he would ask me, well, did that go well? Was that a yeah. good event? And I was like, yeah, I was like, were you happy? And he's like, I don't know. I'll tell you tomorrow. And then tomorrow will be like, yeah, I think I was okay. I think I was kind of happy. And so it was like this, usually a delay, even for my daughter. I'd be like, well, did you enjoy your birthday? I'm thinking about it. And then the next day it was like, yes, my birthday was very fun. So I had to run through a whole different, it felt like processing 
I don't know. Check in. Was it good? Was it not? Okay. Now I have the answer. It was good. It was fun, but it's so hard as the parent, like, I just want to see it on your face sometimes in the moment of the party. But that's yeah, but that's the whole part about the expressing of emotions. You know, it could go one way in terms of I'm already a little bit aroused, I'm already stressed, but you don't see it because I don't know yet what it is and how to express it. But it could also be the same in the positive feelings. I'm happy, but I still don't know that I'm happy. So maybe tomorrow I will be able to tell you. And you know, that's why they need processing time because. That's one of the most difficult things is to, I remember a woman when she went to the psychiatrist every two weeks and he asked her, how are you doing? And she said, I never can answer that question because how am I doing? Come on, uh, that's a difficult question. Do I have to make a statistical analysis of my emotions of the last two weeks and, and calculate an average with a range of something? Or, or, And when I say I'm good, he will think, why are you sitting here? And if I'm saying um, ah, I'm not very good, then he will think I'm, I'm I'm close to suicide, maybe. And she says it's so difficult talking about these emotions. And therefore, I, I especially, you know, you also have a big group of autistic people who cannot even express with words what they are experiencing. And I think working on happiness and well-being should be more than asking them all the time, are you okay? I think we should, you call it pre-regulation. Uh, they can learn to pre-regulate, but I think the people around them should pre-regulate as well. And that means, for instance, making sure that there are enough breaks during the day. If they can't organize it, we are going to organize it. Planning indeed positive feeling moments because they would never think of it. Oh yeah, I could go to a concert here. Hmm? No, do that. So um, while while we think of okay, should we do that? Um, you know, it's it's their life. Um, now, empowering is sometimes understood as you can't program anymore and you can't suggest anymore. I think we should, because as you said, many autistic children, youngsters, and adults, um, it's not that they are not concerned about their well-being, but to use a technical term, they often lack the executive functions to organize their own well-being. Then we should organize it for them. And then it, um, I've even had my autistic adults feel like when their spouse makes a positive suggestion, like, you know, maybe it seems like you're stressed. Do you want to take a bath? Do you need time with the dog? Don't control me. Don't, don't, don't tell me what to do. So a lot of the spouses would say, okay, Stephanie, I'm sick of trying to suggest, you know, positive things because it comes across to my spouse as a demand or a control or something like that. And I'm just trying, I'm, I'm, I'm reading his body that he's not reading and I'm picking up that he's stressed and I'm because of my empathy and I'm trying to offer suggestions and it's don't control me. And it's like, okay, it feels like a lose, lose situation here. Yeah. But again, probably when, when the spouse says that it's already too late, he's already close to red. And when I'm close to red, my Everything my wife says is wrong and I don't take it from her. And after a while, I think she was actually right in reading my body language. I was stressed, but she waited too long telling me because I was already close to the red zone. And, and then, then I don't accept any positive suggestions anymore, even though afterwards, I think that was not such a bad suggestion she made. So Sue thinks, be earlier with your pre-regulation and say, okay, uh, you had a tough day at work and... and if you are tired later tonight, you could, and then then you can refer to the bath or the shower or whatever. And a uh, second thing is that, and that's why I think it's so important that we do psychoeducation, that the autistic uh, individual himself or herself learns about, okay, sometimes I'm over my level of good feeling. I'm too aroused. I'm too excited. I'm, I'm too stressed. And these are the things that can help me then. And that they kind of put reminders in their own smartphone saying, are you okay? Maybe time to take a bath. Because if you plan it in advance yourself, then it's your idea. Um, and that's why I um, that's why I make these happy plans. No, happy plans is a form of psychoeducation where with an autistic individual, with, with children, I do it with the parents, with the autistic individuals, I ask them, okay, let's find out together what could be good relaxing activities for you and how are you going to plan those when it's their choice then. And we do this at a moment when they are still relaxed and open for this learning. So by the time they are stressed, it's not me anymore who has to tell them, 
maybe you should take a bath or take a walk, go out for a while and take a walk and take some fresh air. It's, it's you know, in their planning. And, and this is what I'm missing in many schools that they they teach these children all kinds of stuff, except the stuff around well-being and happiness. And, you know, I I would try to, um, when I would advocate for my daughter, because she she had a high IQ, like well in the 140s, and she'd finish her work first. And then usually what she'd get in trouble with is sitting there and being bored. And I was like, why can't she, while she's waiting on her classmates, pull out her favorite book, pull out um, a coloring book, or use it as a, um, a sensory kind of decompressing time, let her sit in the back in a bean bag and just chill and kind of come back. And the answer was always, that's not fair. I don't have time to manage that. And I would say, do you have time to manage a 30 to 40 minute meltdown? Or she was a fan of eloping and escaping from the classroom. And I was like, so instead of that, where you're going to have to punish and consequence and all of that, like, why can't she take that 10 minutes that you know she's going to have? Everybody else is still working and just let her decompress and do something fun. It was not fair. That was always what I was told. It's not fair to the other students. And I was like, the other students are on the spectrum. I don't I did not understand this concept of fairness here. So behavior focused of when the child is acting out or dysregulated to punish or get the child back on their behavior intervention plan instead of well-being and happiness so that they actually want to be at school and learn in the first yeah. place. It's backwards. But, but, you know, that's that's one of the my main criticisms on the whole behavioral approach. Oh, is, there's nothing wrong to work on behavior to start with. But let's not forget that behavior is always the consequence of how we understand the world at that moment and how we feel about the world. And, and addressing behavior without taking into account the thoughts and the ideas and the emotions behind it is, uh, again, like trying to cut off the top of an iceberg and then the rest will come up and and, and it will not. You, you need to take into account what's underneath and invisible. And when it comes to, to well-being, um, you know, one of the things that I do in happy plans, the plans that I make around well-being, is a good feeling box. Uh, and that could be a good feeling purse, that could be a good feeling backpack or whatever. And every there are schools now in Belgium where every child is entitled to have a good feeling box. And the moment they don't feel well, or the moment they think I need to unwind for a while, for 10 minutes, they're always, they have to raise their hand and say, is it okay if I take it? But they're always allowed to take something from their good feeling toolbox and to do something um, or, or you know, could be a fidgeting toy that could indeed be coloring a mandala um, or, or listening to some music that is relaxing. And those children who are allowed to do that, they, they can concentrate much better the following 50 minutes. So actually, this is a win-win. Teachers, indeed, as you rightly say, teachers will win a lot of time if they allow children. Um, and you you need to trust the children. You need to trust them because one of the, the fears behind it from teachers is they will abuse it. They will all the time look for their well-being activities and they will not be uh, willing anymore to listen to me and to do the more difficult task. And that's actually not the case. Well, occasionally, yes, there are always exceptions. You know, there will be children who are smart enough to think, mm -mm, I can use this system. But most children will not abuse this most children will actually only do it when they need it. And once they know they are allowed, they will probably be even able to stay on focus longer without engaging in the well-being activity. Because they know if it really gets too bad, I can still have access to that. It's like, you know, and this is, you know, teachers should learn about scientific uh, research about stress. One of the things that, that, uh, was already discovered in the 60s is, and that's a difficult word, they call it perceived control. One of the major antidotes for stress is the idea that you are in control, that you are in charge. Because a lot of stress from autistic children and adults comes from their environment that they have no control over. That and it's unpredictable. <laughs> and it's unpredictable, yes. That could be sensory things, that could be social things, that could be demands by teachers. But if you have a part of the world where you say, look, this part of the world I control, that that you know that makes you resilient to all the unpredictability out there. So I think we should give uh, children, um, the, my latest book that I wrote together with a colleague, it's going to be translated, by the way, uh, in English and available in the US by the end of the year. 
Um, one of the things there is that we say, and this is counter to the behavioral approach, don't address the behavior, address the needs. And the need could be predictability. The need could also be autonomy. And that's a very important need. Autonomy means I'm in charge. And of course, you know, that does not mean that every student can be the boss in the classroom. The moment you're living or working together with other people, it's always about, okay, let's make sure that everybody feels good here. So it's not just you can do what you want. No, I have to take into account the needs of other people. But I think we should start more from meeting the needs. And if a child says, I need five minutes here to unwind so I can better concentrate the next 50 minutes, then it's only a benefit of acknowledging this need and, and letting the child do whatever he or she wants. Thank you.